I want to talk to you this morning about the battle that rages for your mind. You are in a mental battle, maybe the likes of which you've never experienced in your lifetime. And I'm going to share with you the reasons why and how it's important that you and I win that battle now. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the scripture is describing a time in humanity when people had become incapable of hearing the words of God or following any thoughts except their own. And you have to be aware that Satan is coming against this generation in an unprecedented measure. He is attacking this generation to take the thoughts of God out of the minds of an entire society. He's doing it through the school system. He's doing it in our colleges. He's doing it in the marketplace. He's doing it in the halls of government. And he's even doing it in the house of God, trying to eradicate everything that comes from the mind of God to blind an entire generation, to take captive as many as he can, for the scripture says he knows that his time is short. That fallen nature that was sown into humankind in the Garden of Eden, that which is resident within you and me, all of society, every man, every woman, every created, has this capacity of sin inside that manifests itself through the thought that I can be as God and I can determine in myself what is good and what is evil. I don't need God to tell me what the parameters of acceptable behavior are, I can determine that on my own. That's exactly the warfare. Just as Satan came in and tempted Adam and Eve with this thought and they bought into this thought and they stepped outside of the parameters of the protection of God. And look at the heartache that came into humanity because of it. Look at the heartache that visited their own home when one of their sons became a murderer and murdered his brother. Oh no, the devil never paints the whole picture. He only paints a little piece of the canvas and it's always the little piece that's got sunshine in it. He never paints the side that has death, the side that has decay and despair and depression and addiction and hopelessness and broken families and tears and sorrow. He never paints that side of the canvas. He only paints the sunny side first. I've been here 21 years in America and I remember coming here thinking, what an incredible nation this is, the freedom here. But in 21 years, I have witnessed the moral decline of this nation. I've witnessed something that terrifies my heart. I've, I've watched a whole generation taken captive by ungodly thought and moved away from the very fabric of what makes a nation strong and what makes a people truly virtuous. Verse 18 of Romans 1 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things that are not fitting. You see, here's the, the point. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted the name of God eradicated from their society. They wanted the name of Jesus only to be a curse word in G-rated movies. They, this is what they wanted of God. They wanted everything that would remind them of the one who had blessed them taken out of their coasts. Oh, how history repeats itself. God comes, sets the people free, gives blessing and power, gives knowledge and understanding, and we do the same thing in ignorance that many before have done, saying, thank you for what you did, but would you mind leaving our borders? We'll take it from here now. Would you mind letting us alone? We don't want you interrupting our good lifestyle. We don't want you interrupting our commerce, our pursuit of life, our ideas of liberty and happiness. We choose to embrace these things as we envision them to be, not as your word says that they are. We have snubbed our noses at God too long. We've entered into the fields of the fatherless. 
forgetting that God's word says. 50 million babies have been aborted in this nation. And we're going into the schools of those we didn't kill in the womb and telling them there is no God. We have entered into the fields of the fathers. And God says, when you do that, I will rise up and defend them. We've crossed the line in this society. The only thing left is the prayer meeting. The only thing left is you and I going again to our knees with lives as much as we know, walking in obedience to what God has asked us to do and with hearts filled with faith and with a passion in our heart that says, oh God, oh God, I pray God for an awakening in this city and every church. I don't care what name's on the door anymore. Oh Jesus, son of God, visit the people who come to your house. Visit our parks, our businesses, our schools. Visit us, God, as you've done in the days of old. I know what God can do. I know he can visit this society. It looks so big to us, it looks so insurmountable, but that's always the way it's been throughout the course of history. The enemy armies gather, they've got the superior armor, they've, they've got this, the upper side, seeming to have all the advantage and all God's people have left is faith. As the people of God, it's so important now that our minds become shrouded in this book. And as Paul said, whatever is of virtue, whatever is of good report, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is lovely, think on these things and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. It's time to get out of the seat of the scornful. It's time to stop associating with sinners. If we're associating for any other reason but winning them to Christ, it's time to make the break, folks. It's time to get oil in our lamps. We don't have that long. Folks, do you know how close we are to the coming of Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us we don't know the very day or the hour, but we're not children of darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. Can you see it? Do you understand that we're on the threshold of the return of Christ now? He's right at the door. He's, I can hear his footsteps coming. There's something in my heart that's saying, get your lamp out, trim your lamp, get ready. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. That's got to be the cry of the church now. The bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Get oil in your lamp. Get ready. The Son of God is coming. The world as we know it is coming to an end. It's all coming to an end. This insanity in the Middle East and nation now rising against nation. Calamities coming upon the earth just as Jesus said they would all leading to this definitive moment. Folks, the ungodly know that Christ is coming. There's something in the hearts of every man, woman, and child that knows the hour we're living in. We're living in the season of Christ's return. And when people take lightly this salvation, when Christ is only just an add-on to an already set in motion life plan, when Jesus is no more than a song on Sunday and fire insurance for the rest of the week, when there's no living relationship, men and women don't read their Bible because they can't understand it. And that's what happens with the party crowd, the Jesus party crowd. That's what happens to them. So it's happening in this generation. Oh, how unaware they're going to be, how caught off guard many are going to be. When all hell begins to break out and they'd stand in their congregation and say, preacher, you told me that if I would come to Jesus, it would be nothing but wealth and health and happiness and prosperity and a bigger slice of the pie. You lied to me. You could be sitting here this morning and you can recognize, say that man's speaking from God. The words that he speaks, I know they're true, but you can't be moved to change your behavior through it. You can't be moved to bend your knee. You can't be moved to say my ways are not God's ways. It's a strange affliction of those who have played games with the holy things of God. The ability to recognize truth, but a lack of ability to embrace what they recognize. If you are able to be under conviction, thank God for it. If you are living in sin and you are bothered by it, thank God that you are bothered. That means God is still in your thoughts. God is still with you. God is still fighting for you. The danger is that when God is no longer in your thoughts, when you've sinned away the day of grace as they used to preach years ago in the house of God, when you've so resisted God, then finally he's just withdrawn. Say, okay, have it your way. Live your way. Create your own system of right and wrong. Don't bend your knee to God. And he walks away. And a man who lives in evil starts thinking he's doing good, even begins to think that heaven might be his home when it's all over.
God is no longer in any of his thoughts. As in the days of Noah, his thoughts are continuously evil. He doesn't think they're evil. But when you have expelled God from the borders of your mind, there's nothing left but that which is created out of the human spirit, which in contrast to the holiness of God, of course, is evil. Psalm 15 verses one and two tells us the person who speaks the truth in his heart will be given the power to stand no matter the difficulty of the time. That's why Hebrews chapter three and four, three times says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you can still hear God, don't harden your heart. If God is in your thoughts, if God is fighting against that which wants to occupy your mind, if you feel like there's a war going on inside of your head, thank God there is a war. That means two opposing sides are still there. When there's no longer a war, you've either given into one side or the other. But thank God there's a war. Thank God that those of us who know him, we, we can't do wrong without being convicted of the Holy Spirit immediately. We fight in our minds, but the difference is that the true believer, God is in our thoughts. He stands as the one who says, come to me in your time of struggle. Come quickly to the throne of grace that I may help you in your time of need. God is with us in our thoughts. I thank the Lord for that with all my heart. And he promises us victory and power to withstand the downward pull of this fallen generation. And there is a huge downward pull to conform now in this generation. We are living in a time very much like Daniel's time when statues of are being raised up of what man says, this is what the image of society should look like. And when you hear the music, you better bow or you're gonna suffer for it. God is the only one who can give us the power to stand. God is the one because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses four and five, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are mighty. The weapons of our warfare, God gives us through faith in the finished victory of Christ on the cross. He gives us the power to pull down these thoughts that would try to rise up and exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. Whether they're coming in from the outside or they're coming in from the inside. As Paul said, I've got fightings without and fears within. It doesn't matter where they come from. God promises me the power to pull them down. I can walk in the light of scripture. I can walk in the truth of God. I can stand in an evil day. I can be given authority to make a difference, even though everything around me looks like it's going the other way. And I might seem, you might seem like the only fish in the stream going upstream and everybody else is going the opposite direction. But God says, I've given you weaponry and power to pull down these strongholds and to cast down these arguments and all these high things that have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God and to bring these thoughts into captivity. That's why it's so important to win the battle of the mind. That is the battleground that we've got to fight on now. And that's where the battle must be won because we are all that is left to stay the hand of God's judgment on this nation. Hear me on this. We're all that's left. There's no political party. There's no new preacher. There's nothing going to have this nation is on a collision course with Almighty God himself. And there's nothing left to stop it from where it's going but you and me coming in boldly as Hebrews tells us to do to the throne room of grace and saying, God, I'm not here just for myself. Thank you, God, for winning this victory. But I'm here for my city. I'm here for my family. I'm here for my friends. I'm here for my enemies. I'm here, God, for those that don't even know who you are. I'm here to cast down in the name of Jesus Christ the thoughts that are holding them captive and keeping them from the salvation that's freely offered them in Christ Jesus. That's why, folks, we've got to pray like we've never prayed before. This is not an hour to play. It's an hour to pray. It's an hour to come into the throne room of God. It's an hour to be filled with faith. It's an hour to stand like Moses stood before Pharaoh and say, no deals with you. It's an hour to come to the throne of God, not in our strength, but in our weakness not with a, a history of our faithfulness, but with a recognition that God's mercy has covered everything that we've done to offend his name. Coming into that throne room of grace 
in the midst of our recognition of our own poverty and our own need. Not coming in with arrogance, not coming in knowing everything, but knowing this one thing, that there's only one name given under heaven whereby men might be saved. Coming in and believing that when we pray, God hears us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Jesus said, now my eyes will be open and my ears will be listening for the prayer that is prayed in this place. It's time to pray, folks. It's time to pray. It's not about a program. I'm not talking about a program. It's time to pray. It's life or death for people now. It's time to pray. It's time for you and I to go down on our knees and begin to petition God. It's time for us to make a decision. As Joshua said to the people of his day, if it seemed difficult for you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.